So, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, we're doing a webinar today on nanomaterials, specifically around the EU medical device regulation, but we're going to touch upon a few others off the bat where nanomaterials is or will likely uh, become part of the restrictions. So I'm Bruce Collier with EPA Consulting Services here at Clagan. Uh, it's a bit of an interesting topic. We're talking mostly about the EU medical device regulation and nanomaterials. And the sections of the MDR that address nanomaterials are pretty open-ended. And it's a lot about you know assessing the safety, making sure they're safe without a tremendous amount of guidance. So we're, we're gonna talk about the definitions and a bit about the guidances such that they are, mostly they're older. And then um, we're also gonna talk a little bit about other regulations which are or will regulate nanomaterials and explain how that comes about. But most of this is around MDR. And when we're talking about nanomaterials, it's also worthwhile, worthwhile identifying where you see them. There's some intentional uses like biocides. A lot of nanomaterials with their significant surface area to volume ratio have significant biocidal uh, properties, which is one of the reasons why they're seen as a bit dangerous. Most biocides kill organics, that's the whole point, which makes them a danger um, to organic life forms like us. But we'll talk about the intentional uses like biocides, and we'll talk about the less intentional use in additives. And we'll talk about where they're commonly used and why they're generally not nanomaterials, but can, and the interesting hand wavy. And then we'll talk about some practical approaches, like how do you actually do compliance for this in practice? You have a situation where you have a requirement in EUMDR, and MDR, people doing compliance for MDR normally end up having someone, whether their own regulatory, an external consultant, the notified body, going line by line through the regulations, seeing how you address each requirement. And nanomaterials appear in two areas. And what they're going to expect is some level of objective evidence that you can put in your tech file and show how you've addressed nanomaterials. So we're going to talk about the options. There isn't one prescribed way to handle it. You just need to make sure you address um, their safety. So the webinar here is intended, like usual, to be about 50 minutes. Um, it was right on time this morning uh, with Q&A at the end. This is a fairly open-ended and uh, topic. It's also very technical to a certain extent, so feel free to ask any questions. I just put them in a control panel and I'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. Um, so a little bit about us, we do a tremendous amount of laboratory testing, especially on the medical device, but also a lot in REACH and ROHS. For new products, it's definitely one of the easiest ways to do product compliance. I have my new product, I have all these regulations. The suppliers are not only not trustworthy, the data is incomplete and I'm not comfortable with it. The nice thing about testing, it works every time. It takes a set amount of time. It's a set cost. You get to meet your uh, new product development deadlines. It's fantastic. But we also do a tremendous amount of testing on the medical side. We do uh, probably the majority of medical device manufacturers. Um, we do testing for CMRs and EDCs, endocrine disruptors and, and carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxins, an invasive or fluid or air path. And we'll talk a little bit about that here. When in doubt, which like any pricing for it, just send us the picture, a web link, and we'll be happy to quote. Um, it's easy also to do other requirements like SCIP, the REACH stuff, the ROHS, Prop 65 at the same time. There's so much overlap because a lot of these are based on classifications of plant cancer classification, reproductive toxicity classifications, endocrine disruptor classifications, bioaccumulation. They all end up being kind of similar. They just often regulate the substance in a little different ways. So as long as you handle the differences, um, they're very effective set piece ways to handle it. So if you're looking and saying, hey, I've got my product, I have to meet all these requirements, just test it, especially new products. It's really straightforward. It's also fantastic for legacy products. Often legacy, you do representative ones to, to represent the whole family, but it is easily the most effective way to tell your management saying, hey, look, I'm going to be compliant to everything and it's going to be compliant this number of weeks and that's the way it is. As opposed to a lot of the other methods where supplier data gathering, I'm not really confident in the data and I'm not really sure when it's going to finish and I'm not exactly sure what the outputs are for each regulation. It's just, we're here to help. Uh, we also do a lot of monthly and quarterly updates for the companies. This is easily one of the most popular services. I think we do this for about 70 companies. We sit down every month or every quarter and explain the changes in restricted materials requirements and how they affect your products. Like what you now have to comply to the new stuff. Here are the new SVHCs. This is whether or not they're going to be in your product. And this is why. Here's new Prop 65 substance. This is how they're now prosecuting BPA for Prop 65. Um, this is why batteries are not in scope of ROHS, which includes the battery pack. And here's the verbiage 
uh, without prejudice, which means I'm out of scope and explaining why that term without prejudice means out of scope, even though it, you wouldn't think about it in the English language and explain things to you. And it's, it's just yourselves. It's very interactive. You can ask questions and say, hey, uh, my, my supplier is asking for this. Or my customer, I'm sorry, my customer's asking for this. What does this mean? My supplier told me to have all these SVHCs. Is that real? Um, how to handle that? Definitely when uh, we've seen so much SVHC information for suppliers, it is mostly garbage. The lead and brass stuff's actually not too bad. Outside of that, mostly garbage. It's amazing um, how bad the system is. And there's a better way to often do skip. And we're probably the, the biggest player in the skip side. We have done the skip declarations for dozens of companies already, done you know, hundreds of thousands of hundreds or thousands of hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of declarations. Um, and we can help you with the practical side, like how to do it for your products. And then you can have this whole miscellaneous category of everything else you sell in the EU and how you handle all that. Just contact us. We're really good at it. We have a really set piece way to start. We show you exactly how to do it. We set up your processes and then we can do as much as you want of it. Um, we're more than capable of doing your product lines for you and it's straightforward and you know what the answer is. So a lot of people come to us because there's just, there is a better way. That's a big focus on everything we do. There's got to be a better way and, and focusing and developing that better way instead of just hitting our head against the wall and not really producing anything. We're big on outputs. You're not doing compliance because it's fun. Well, it might be for some, fun for some people like ourselves at times, but um, you're doing it because you, you need to do the compliance to sell in various marketplaces. So it's all around the output. You need this output. It's really this checkbox you need to close to sell the product. And that's where we come in. And usually for whatever the checkbox is, especially for restricted materials, there's usually a better way to do it. There's a more effective way to do it, both in time and money and success. Um, that's what we're here for. So on the main topic, nanomaterials. Uh, they're regulated under the EU medical device regulation. Um, two sections, 10.6. Uh, uh, devices shall be designed and manufactured in such a way as to reduce as far as possible risks linked to the size and property of the particles which are or can be released in the patient's or user's body um, unless they come in contact with intact skin only. Specific attention shall be given to nanomaterials. So two little things here. One, this is gonna be a common problem throughout the presentation. My control panel blocks the very right side of the screen. So sometimes the last couple letters are a bit of a, in any of these pieces are a bit of a, a remembering game. Fortunately, I have a fairly decent memory, but there'll be moments when I say something that isn't 100% the same as the text, because if it's on the right side, I can't necessarily see it. And this happens every time and I really should plan for it. This whole thing about the safety at 10.6, the very last line says, special attention shall be given to nanomaterials. Awesome. What is that? Well, they do provide a definition of nanomaterials. We'll talk about that. What's special attention? So they have to reduce the risks. So what ends up is happening without, there's no specific guidance on how this is done. The manufacturer has to show how you address this risk. So when you do your tech file, you're going to need objective evidence to show how you address this risk which comes down to like special attention shall be given to nanomaterials. That means nanomaterials need to be brought up in how you address this. That's what we're gonna talk about where we have these fairly vague uh, requirements that need to be addressed. And how do you provide objective evidence that not only you are comfortable with, but your regulatory group is comfortable with, your external auditors are comfortable with, and your notified body is comfortable with. Normally they want a document they can point to that addresses the question. Where does this document address nanomaterials? That's what they want to see. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about, the different options for um, objective evidence. And it's not just one. Um, there are a variety of options. Since this is, and this is true for a lot of the MDR, there isn't one way to skin a cat. That unless they said, thou shalt do it this way, um, as long as you address it and the regulatory group and notify body agree, then that works. And so we're going to talk about a bunch of different options. We're a big fan here at Clegg and hanging together instead of hanging separately. If you're going to be wrong, be wrong in good company. Um, so if, if somebody's wrong, everybody's wrong. And it's a lot easier that way. We're a big fan of things are going to go sideways at times. The suppliers will make mistakes. Human error is a massive section. Um, understanding every definition is not that easy. We want to structure it so when things go wrong, which generally they, between the supply chain and everything else, there's always a possibility that there's no punishment for it. So you want to want to address this and de-risk it. You don't want to cause harm, which is actually a big problem here. 
and you want to address this in your tech file. So we're going to talk about options. Now, this is not that dissimilar a section than 10.4. So 10.4, which we deal with every day, is design and manufacture devices, mostly around restricted materials. Devices are those parts there and those materials that are invasive, fluid contacting or gas contacting. And if they have carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxins, CMRs, or endocrine disrupting chemicals, human health, above 0.1% by weight in any material touching the fluid or the gas or uh, invasive, you need to justify and label it. So again, it's around the design and manufacture. They're very similar sections. So a lot of what we do in nanomaterials um, is around CMRs and endocrine disruptors. They aren't necessarily, they aren't, well, they aren't the same chemicals, but the processes we use for determining carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxins, and endocrine disruptors in the materials is very portable to the nanomaterials. You're looking at materials in your invasive fluid or gas path in looking for particular substances in your materials, there are rules and processes that can be put around it. We're a big fan of processes. You really want a process that addresses situations effectively. Also the fact we get audited all the time, we really obviously need processes, which we're a big fan of. So the other part of EUMDR, a little bit different section, is about classification. All devices incorporated consisting of nanomaterials are classified as class three if they present a high or medium potential for internal exposure, class 2b if they present a low potential for internal exposure, and class 2a if they present a negligible, negligible potential for internal exposure. So we're not experts on classification for medical devices, I must admit. However, this is another section that you have to address. So you have to address whether you have nanomaterials that will change your classification. The classification is very, very important. Um, and definitely obviously changes a lot of the things you do for medical device regulation. So there's two sections you have to address nanomaterials. And you want, in some cases, like, well, this is not applicable. You really need something, objective evidence, to say how you've addressed it. And that's what a lot of we're going to cover here. There isn't one way to do this. But we'll talk about all the different options on addressing it. How do you address these nanomaterials? Now, before we get into addressing it specifically, um, there are other people on the call who are not in medical devices and uh, a little bit interested in the topic. So nanomaterials will be regulated in other regulations. They are currently regulated in the EU Biocides, which would be regulation, not directive, and the EU Food Contact uh, Directive. Um, most nanomaterials, a lot of the main use is, is as a biocide. They're very small size, to uh, size, which gives them an incredible surface area to volume ratio, makes them very effective biocides that kill organics. Uh, nanocrystal and silver, nanocrystal and zinc. If you get antibacterial toilet or watch, you're looking at nanocrystal and zinc or nanocrystal and silver. Their small size is very effective at killing organics. One of the downsides of the ability to kill organics, it's not necessarily the best material to have wandering around inside the human body. Why the medical device regulations are looking at it. It's the main use of the nanomaterials or biocides, but they do have other applications. Their physical properties, whether it's reflectiveness or, or other properties, the size of the molecule does affect what they do. Um, EU food contacting, of course, nanomaterials are regulated in EU food contacting. I mean, so. For example, literally one of the approvals out there is if you have a milk carton and you put nanomaterials on the inside coating, like nanocrystal and zinc, because silver is a bit expensive, it will stop the organics from growing in that milk. That milk will last longer. It's a preservative. It would be in the internal coating of the milk. Is that a good idea? That's why there's a bunch of regulations around that. So its main function is usually biocidal, and because it kills organics, there's a number of reasons why it's heavily regulated. Things that can kill organics are, by nature, dangerous to other organ or, uh, organisms like us. Other regulations have ability and are intended to also regulate nanomaterials. RHS and REACH do have nanomaterial regulation capability. I'll give you a very specific example. RHS was written before the definition of the nanomaterial came out, which is around 2015-ish. RHS was rewritten in 2011, but they even knew at the time, almost a decade ago, that nanomaterials are going to need to be addressed. Their ability to kill organics is an important consideration. So there's a section in RHS where it talks about how to that how to review and amend Annex 2. Annex 2 is where they have things like lead and cadmium, mercury and hexachrome and all the goodnesses and the new four phthalates that are banned on RHS. 
the EU Commission has a process where they can review additional chemicals like they did for phthalates and they're doing for a lot of about 100 other chemicals right now um, for addition to RHS. RHS will be expanding, not quite at the rate as reach SVHC, but breathe in, breathe out. RHS over the next five years will expand at about half the pace of reach SVHC. There's going to be a lot more restrictions. Which brings us to a, a bit of a side topic. One of the very important things we do for compliance is not data gathering, it's specification. So many people have created uh, drawings and, and specifications over time that says must be RHS compliant. But when RHS changes or there's a new regulation, what are you really doing about that? What we recommend is instead of saying must be RHS compliant specification, you say must be compliant with ACME spec, whatever your name is, one, two, three, four. And then you control that separately. It'd be more complicated. ROHS is five years ago is not the same as this year, which is not the same as 10 years ago, et cetera. So um, ROHS will continue to expand. In the expansion, they basically said, the commission shall take special account of whether a substance, including substance of very small size, a very small internal surface structure. This is before they had the definition nanomaterial. This is 2011. The nanomaterial definition is really around 2015. Um, could have a negative impact on EEE, electronics waste management, or give rise to uncontrolled release in the environment. Nanocrystalline zinc getting into the uh, wastewater could be interesting. Um, you probably have to worry about algae a lot less. And it could lead to ex unacceptable exposure of workers involved in waste collection. So a key note about RHS, not everybody's aware that it's not around user safety. RHS is around the safety of recycling workers and the environment around the recycling facility. It's not whether the user of the tablet gets poisoned by the lead inside. It's a recycling worker when it grinds up, do they inhale the lead or does it end up in the wastewater? That's what the RHS restriction is about. So they're saying, hey, if a nanomaterial does any of these things, guess what? It can be restricted to RHS. So even RHS almost a decade ago wrote in the capability to restrict nanomaterials. And every single regulation of this type is going to have nanomaterials addressed in it. Um, they didn't know exactly what they're going to do with it, but they basically said, you know, nanomaterials can be dangerous. Silver is not necessarily dangerous. Nanocrystalline silver is. Its ability to kill organics is, is an important consideration. So you can't just classify a substance based on cast number. Its size does affect its properties. And so that's what they're in here. So even though we're talking about medical device regulation, that's really what we're going to be talking about mostly here. Um, almost every single regulation this type has or intends to have um, the ability to restrict nanomaterials. RHS was so long ago, it didn't even use the word nanomaterials, but it basically described what eventually became nanomaterials. So everything we're talking about here and the risks will apply to everything. RHS the substance has to go to the review process. So when's the first nanomaterials? They'll probably end up in the review process in the next one or two years to start seeing some. Now, a lot of what you see in the medical device regulation is really from an opinion and guidance in 2015, which I have a link here. Um, now, even though the MDR was published in 2017, it was really many years of iteration. So the actual changes between 2015 and 2017 weren't terribly large. It's one of the reasons why the nanomaterial definition is there, but there isn't that much substance. Um, they expected the medical industry and potentially the EU commission to write more guidances in the future about nanomaterials. But a lot of the fundamentals around nanomaterials risks for medical devices are in here. And this is where a lot of it came. Now there's more since then, but this is where a lot of it points to. In this guidance, it definitely separates the difference between non-invasive and invasive medical devices. So non-invasive, these are devices in contact with intact skin, releasing nano-sized components, released nano-sized components of low potential to penetrate through the skin. I.e., if it's only surface or skin contacting, <coughs> we're not, they're not terribly worried about nanomaterials. The skin is pretty strong. Even nanocrystalline silver or, or, or nano-zinc is probably not going to be a significant risk. They're not as worried about it touching intact skin. And so generally low risk. Where they said there's a big risk is invasive. These all class invasive devices may potentially generate nanoparticles, whether they have nanoparticles initially or they can generate by shedding. Now, normally shedding should be larger particles, but they're leaving it open. They can release nanoparticles, usually because they have embedded or surface coated nanoparticles that get released. For invasive devices, the release nanoparticles have a direct port of entry in the body depending on the localization of the device used. So if they're inside, that's why they're worried about the nanomaterials. A lot of nanomaterials are effective biocides. They kill organics. Maybe not the best thing to be wandering around free inside the human body. It's basically what they're saying. Products consisting of free nanomaterials lead to high potential for systemic exposure. 
you have nanocrystalline silver, nanocrystalline zinc on the surface of something, and it's not tightly bound, and it goes for a wander inside the body, you, there might be problems. There will probably be necrotic events. It will kill them. The other thing about anything that causes necrosis has also the ability to trigger an allergic reaction. Um, way, uh, for example, vaccines work or sensitization of laboratory animals to, to food is you have an adjuvant, a chemical like dissolved aluminum that leads to cell death and necrosis. These, and then the immune system blames whatever protein or virus is nearby as the cause and gets an immune response. So nanomaterials can also cause cell death, but the ability, if they can cause any kind of necrosis, to accidentally confuse the system and create an allergic reaction to the medical device material. So, for example, a lot of people um, have medical devices that change titanium for implants because it doesn't have the same uh, potential for allergy as a nickel-containing uh, stainless steel. Um, the problem is if you release anything else to cause necrosis, it is not impossible that the body gets confused and thinks any um, titanium reactions with your bone or skin is the cause and has, starts having um, allergic reactions to titanium. It's one of the side effects of, of anything that causes cell death necrosis, which many nanomaterials can, that they can convince the body that something else is an invader and creates an immune response, like a titanium allergy like a, I'm not say silicone allergy, it's really the, um, one of the vulcanization agents that can be used in silicone copolymers, but convince the body that something in the medical device is actually causing it and create an immune response, which creates the allergy to the material. So nanomaterials have a lot of risk if they wander around. They can cause, of course, cell death. Cell death has direct effects and very indirect effects. It can confuse the immune system to blame um, one of the other materials present for the the damage and then create some level of immune response to the medical device or implant um, whether a high systemic exposure occurs depends on the actual use of the medical device and the route of exposure and the location where the medical device is used so they're basically saying it's very situational awesome so this is where it really came from in a lot of ways so this is 2015 we're looking at the medical device regulation 2017 you'll see a lot the limited amount of text we talked about earlier follows these not really worried about in skin we are worried about its risk that need to be assessed in invasive materials. We can't really have this stuff wandering around the system. It can cause a lot of problems. Out on surface of skin, we're not terribly concerned. Wandering around inside, we are concerned. Now, nanomaterials, now I apologize, as I read this, a lot of the right side is blocked on the, uh, the control panel I have up. So I'll do my best here. Nanomaterials and products used in surgery are generally embedded inside or coated in larger products. A lot of the nanomaterial, potential nanomaterials you'll see are embedded in plastics. And as long as they're lower concentration, um, it's not that high of a risk. The duration of contact with the patient is relatively short. Um, exposure to the bound nanomaterials, the site of treatment will therefore be high in all cases where systemic exposure potential of free nanomaterials is likely to be very low. So um, you, when you're dealing with, say, with a surgical instrument that's in contact internally, the surface nanomaterial, the bound nanomaterials will likely have high exposure, but it's not as likely for them to go for a wander unless it has, uh, it's quite soluble or it's degradation products. Local exposure to fixed nanomaterials of site treatment will therefore be high in all cases where systemic exposure potential free nanomaterials may be considered low provided there's only slow generation of wear particles. It means you might have a nanomaterial problem where the surgery is happening, but it's not as likely to go wandering downstream. So the reactivity will normally be at the site of the surgical as opposed to downstream, unless there's wear particles that go for a wander, which is always a risk. If you have something coated in nanocrystalline silver, the nanocrystalline silver comes out, not a good thing. Or if the, the device degrades a bit, it sends particles down coated in biocidal nano, nanocrystalline silver, that's a problem too. So they want you to look at embedded is not a significant risk unless it gets out. Do you want to look at both? Of course, if it's not there, and that's a lot of the process we'll talk about, it's also not a problem. Now, what is a nanomaterial? We keep talking about this you know, wonderful topic. It's really small things. A nanomaterial means a natural, incidental, or manufactured material containing particles in an unbound state, or as an aggregate or an agglomerate. There'll be a test later. No, there won't. Um, but I'll at least explain the differences. Where 50% or more of the particles in the number size distribution of one or more uh, dimensions is in the size range 1 to 100 nanometers. 
So not by the mass of the powder, but the number of particles, where 50% or more of the particles are basically under 100 nanometers. It says 1 to 100, but once you get below 1 nanometer, you're deep below what most crystal sizes can be. Crystals can't really get below 1 nanometer very easily. Okay, so definitions. When we have the quiz at the end, there will be a mar another one. Anyways, um, there's actually a huge debate over two and three here. A particle for the purposes of the definition of nanomaterials means a minute piece of matter with defined physical boundaries. Awesome. This is like doing grade 11 or 12 uh, chemistry definitions again, where I looked at it and go, sure. It's basically a thing. It's a small little particle, the smallest little dot. So think of it as a piece of sand. Way smaller than a piece of sand, but think of it as a piece of sand. An agglomerate, for the purpose of the definition of nanomaterials, means a collection of weakly bound particles or aggregates. There's the definition, the third thing wrapped in here, where the resulting external surface area is similar to the components of the surface area of the individual components. Yeah, I'll get back to that one. I'll show you some examples. Aggregate, for the purposes of the definition of nanomaterials, means a particle composed of strongly bound or fused particles. Think it as aggregates are like sand particles that are fused together. Agglomerate is more like sandstone, where they're kind of all weakly bound together, but you can break them apart. So particle, sand, obviously nanomaterials way smaller than sand, but sand, aggregate, sand that are fused together, and agglomerate is kind of like sandstone, where they're all kind of loosely bound together. So here's some pictures, particles, lots of different sizes there. Aggregated particles, they get fused together. They have very strong bonds. Um, and then agglomerates are basically ones that are maybe pressed together or grown together, but not strongly bonded. It's bonded. It's like sandstone. They're bound together, but it's not quite the same. They say, however it gets that point, it's the individual particles we care about. And the particles then have to be below 50%. Uh, so if above 50% of the particles are, are below 100 nanometers, that's a nanomaterial. Now we have the other side effect that if what leaks out of a non-nanometer one is nanometers, that has to be taken into account too. So we'll get to that. So nano, some materials won't be nanomaterials, but what leaks out of it could be. It has to be addressed, but it's a little less clear. Of course, I'm talking about the definition of aggregate and agglomerate and talking about less clear. Um, think of it as individual particles and whether they're fused together or kind of agglomerate or squished together. So one's fused together and one's kind of like squished together. Think of it that way. It's to the size of the original particles. Now, where do we actually see nanomaterials? We'll get to biocides in a minute, obviously biocides, but a lot of inorganic additives to plastics have that potential. The main colorant in all white plastic or light colored plastic is titanium dioxide. Sometimes barium oxide, but mostly titanium dioxide. Could be zinc oxide too, mostly titanium. And virtually every white or light colored plastic in the medical field uses titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is normally above 100 nanometers, but it doesn't have to be. And we'll talk about that one. So we're looking at colorants bound into the plastic. Fillers, calcium carbonate, a lot of plastic used as a filler. Um, your power cord will be like 5 to 10% calcium carbonate or similar. Normally not an invasive material, but it gives you an idea. This is not an uncommon and more structurally sound plastic even flexible ones like your power cord. Inorganic flame retardants like antimony trioxide. So um, if your materials are in a fire zone, it's an electrified or burning device, electrosurgical or something like that, you'll often have very thin plastics that need an halogenated flame retardant uh, to not light up and fire. Uh, very thin plastics have trouble meeting various candle tests in our burn tests unless they use specialized halogenated or brominated flame retardants in conjunction with antimony trioxide. Antimony trioxide has the ability to be a nanometer size. Is it most of the time? Nope. Can it be? Yes. That's always the one of the hardest parts. Are these nanomaterials all the time? No. Are they nanomaterials most of the time? No. Can they be nanomaterials? Yes. <laughs> and so that creates a bit of the challenge here. How do you address this risk? And then heat stabilizer. Um, PVC, for example, is not stable over temperature. It will, the durometer softness and a variety of other properties will shift with temperature. To keep it the same softness and flexibility at different temperatures, it needs to stabilize. Historically, it was lead and cadmium. So we test even now dollar store PVC, we'll get lead or cadmium all the time. Uh, not allowed, but we'll get it all the time. And that's the stabilizer. It's a cheap way to make it stable. We're more, more likely to see zinc or barium or tin based stabilizers these days. Uh, which a lot of the dibutyl tins and dioctyl tins are being restricted. Um, so more and more zinc stabilizers. 
And they have the potential, at least in original form, to be nanomaterials. Are they most of the time? No. Can they be? Yes. But generally, very rarely. So thing is, we have all these materials that inorganic additives, the plastics, that can be nanomaterials, but are often not. And in brackets, this is not a very helpful statement. So basically, it's lower risk, but it's not low risk, and it's not addressed. So you still have to address the risk. And so I'll explain a little bit about each of these materials. They're <laughs> like, it's mostly good, but not completely. So here are a whole bunch of different grades of titanium dioxide. Uh, titanium dioxide, on average, typical colorant, has about 200, point, uh, about, uh, 200 nanometers in size. So the, the cutoff being 100 nanometers or lower. And you can see the blue one here if you squint. And if you're somebody like me, you have to squint. You have to take your glasses off. Um, and you know when you get that close, but yeah, that was a bit of a shock about two or three, uh, three years ago. And I was trying to read off you know the little writing on ICs to help um, uh, laboratory work, uh, technician on a particular result. I'm like, oh, I can't see it. Then I took off my glasses and I can see it just fine. I'm like, uh oh, it just started. But so if you're like me and you have to basically take your glasses and squint this close, um, you'll see the blue distribution there, and 0.1 microns, 100 nanometers. And you can see the left side of that blue distribution will actually all be nanoparticles. And the right, and most of the hump is not. So as a powder, it doesn't count as nanomaterials because less than 50% of the particles are of that size, based on the number distribution. Um, but can titanium dioxide have smaller crystalline size? Yes, generally doesn't, but it can. Um, and some of the content will be nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles come out, you still have to address them. So in the original powder, as they're embedded into the plastic, it wouldn't normally be a nanomaterial, but some of them, some of the individual particles are nano. And that's an interesting problem. The powder is not a nanomaterial because less than 50% are that size, but there are particles in it that are that size, and what happens if they come out? So this is the sort of thing that has to be addressed. Titanium dioxide is super common in virtually all plastics. It's usually around 200 nanometers, which is fortunately above the hand or 100 nanometer rule. Um, in some cases, and we've talked about in some medical companies, it can be 90% of the particles can be under that size. But nanocrystal and titanium dioxide um, is less common. It is quite available. And it's so whether you control it or not, it's a good question. So can titanium dioxide have been nanocrystal in size? Yes. Is it normally? Not exactly, but it's really darn close. <laughs> and so that's the most common color embedded in your plastic. So using titanium dioxide embedded in your plastic, how you address it, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Zinc oxide is basically the same size and same application, titanium dioxide. I have to flip on a periodic table, they're probably very similar space on the periodic table. Um, notice again, 100 nanometers. Yeah, most of it's above 100 nanometers in the distribution of number of particles, but there's still some below and it's pretty darn close. And can you get nanocrystalline zinc oxide? Absolutely you can. So it's one of the ones you have to be addressed. How do you address this very imperfect situation for a very common, zinc oxide is a very common colorant too, um, additive in your products, where it's right abutted right up against the nanomaterial definition. Calcium carbonate, on the other hand, is a filler. It's normally up in the over one micron size, so a thousand uh, nanometers. It's pretty low risk. You see very low amounts getting down the point and run range. It's a much lower risk. Can you get nanocrystal and calcium carbonate? Yes. Generally you do. Do you? Not normally. The filler is normally a much larger particle. Um, and there are a variety of different grades. But medical devices, which are amazingly sometimes exotic materials, nothing's impossible. So this one's highly unlikely. And you can see the nanomaterial range is well outside their normal distribution ranges. But it doesn't, you can also get nanocrystal and calcium carbonate. It's more specialized and you normally have to ask for it. But again, a lot of medical devices have more specialized uses and it's not impossible to have something like that. Here's antimony trioxide. It's uh, very common and you sell different grades. Most of the time, they're about one micron. My micron is about a thousand nanometers, pretty low risk, but you can see there's a couple different grades that are in the point one range. There's one grade in the far right. That is a nanocrystalline to trioxide. Is it normally nanocrystalline? Nope. Can it be? Yes. And so that's the interesting challenge. <laughs> How do you address the situation where most of the time it's not, but it could be. And if you don't address it, then there'll be challenges. Because it's not like, oh no, it never is. It's most of the time it's not. Which we're doing with a medical device and people also wanting to say, okay, how did you address this? 
Is there no nanomaterials? Well, there could be. Did you address this? What's your objective evidence? And that's what we're going to focus on, the different object, op options for objective evidence for the situation. Is it nanomaterial? Um, there are grades that are basically completely nanomaterials, but generally it won't be. But it could be. So now what? Um, stabilizers, by the way, zinc stearate and calcium stearate, they're the most common stabilizers. Really zinc soap and calcium soap. Their particle size originally is about 5 microns, about 5,000 nan 5, nanometers. Um, they're not normally uh, nanomaterials. Um, and usually when they're used, they become free zinc or free calcium in the plastic. They kind of uh, separate from the stearate, and they're really not a nanomaterial at all. Now, there are exceptions, but most stabilizers, what they really want is the free zinc or the free calcium um, in there. Um, but sometimes they stay attached to stearate. So it's another additive that just has to be addressed. It's also very unlikely to be a problem. Now, biocides, you add a biocide to it. I didn't shove zinc in here. Uh, silver, nanocrystalline silver, or zinc, or nanocrystalline titanium dioxide, or nanocrystalline silver oxide as a biocidal coating. Yes. If you add a biocide, an inorganic biocide, you have to address it almost every time. Virtually all inorganic biocides are nanomaterial. Now, copper itself has biocidal properties. Um, it's nanocrystalline copper, which is the most dangerous. So if you're using a biocide, you have to address it. There'll be a lot of reasons you have to address it. Biocides kill things. Um, that's kind of the point. So it has to be addressed. Many cases, inorganic biocides are nanomaterials. It's high surface area to volume ratio of being such a small particle makes it extremely useful nanomaterial. So if you're intentionally adding a biocide, you're adding a well, you're adding a biocide, it will often have to be addressed. There are organic biocides, which are quite different. They're normally not, they have very different mode of action. They're normally not nanomaterials. But inorganic ones are commonly nanomaterials. So if you have a biocide, it needs to be addressed. Okay, that was cool. I'm sure everybody loved the chemistry lesson. Um, don't worry, there won't be a quiz later. Uh, everybody, everybody, by the way, who registered will receive a copy of the slides, and I'm sure everybody enjoyed that. So what now? We have this imperfect situation with imperfect rules. So in that situation, what we commonly believe in is hanging together instead of hanging separately. If you're going to do something, do what other people are doing. And a lot of cases in this situation, you have to identify how you've objectively addressed the situation. So we want to look at objective evidence. What do I put in my technical file to address nanomaterials? Or more specifically, what do I put in my technical file to prove that I addressed nanomaterials? We can't really say, yeah, we addressed them. So what's the document that did that? Yeah. So they, the, the auditor or the regulatory person or the notified body will be unlikely to be a specialist in nanomaterials. Anything could happen, but unlikely. What they really want to see is they go through legislation. Here's the nanomaterial requirement. How did you address this? It's in the wear product section. Cool, but it says, how did you address nanomaterials? What part of that is in this tech file? Well, we didn't do it. Oh, this is awkward. So um, you really want to look at what's the physical thing I can put in my tech file to show I've addressed nanomaterials. And also very importantly, you don't want to screw up nanomaterials because if you're actually using them and they cause damage, this is a problem. Um, nanomaterials are bio often biocides. They kill organics, which has direct necrotic effects and indirect where it convinces your immune system that something else is causing the necrotic effect. So, when in doubt, start with um, a statement. If it is low risk, write down why. But preferably have it written either referencing other people's work or or written by someone else to say why it's low risk. We don't have intentionally added biocides. We have no intentionally added nanomaterials. Address that additives are unlikely to be between one and 100 nanometers. And this is why. Identify the additives, any additives that we have, they're not only unlikely to be in that size, they're embedded in plastic and they'll never be above 50% of the weight of the plastic. Now, why the 50% is important is because nanomaterials have to be 50% of the weight distribution. So if you also argue, even if they're in there and they're all nanomaterials, it's, it, they're embedded and they're below 50%. So even on the surface, like coating, different story. But if they're embedded and they're below 50%, you say, even though they may individually be nanomaterials, they are, as part of the plastic, the particle size, they make up um, less than 50%. So in this case, it's by mass instead of by particle count, but it's pretty close. Normally, it won't, won't even be close. It'll be like under 10%, so it's not really a concern. Um, the downside is, this is a great statement, do you have any physical data? 
You don't have any objective data. You have a great objective and state, but you don't have any data. So when in doubt, this is a really good start. And But they'll often go, do you have any data to back this up? And that is one little gap here. But it is not a bad starting point. We do this for a lot of companies. The other one's leachables. And of course, the main thing is, as long as they don't end up downstream, the risk is much lower. The classification is different. Now, the classification, you still have to classify if you have nanomaterials and they don't end up downstream. So you still have to know whether you have them. But in terms of looking another way, is look at your leachables for these, these are, uh, inorganics. Copper, antimony, silver, cobalt, nickel, barium, zinc, titanium, calcium. Are any of these showing up in leachables? If they are, you have to identify where they came from. If nickel's from dissolved steel, it's not a nanomaterial. Bad idea, because nickel's a strong allergen. But um, it's not a nanomaterial. If you get titanium, is it? we have it's from the titanium oxide colorant. We reviewed the colorant with the manufacturer or tested under SEM. It's not, none of the particles or no reasonable amount of the particles are, are below 100 nanometers. Um, so that's one way to do it. It's a little imperfect, um, but it is one way to look at it. If you can do your leachables this way, not everybody tests the leachables for all these different elements. A bit of a trick. The other one is what we do for a lot of companies. It's a newer process, but it just maps in so well with all the CMR and endocrine disrupting work we do. If we're already looking, screening for elements and inorganics and such in plastics and many, many organics. Um, it's a straightforward process variation where we you look for all the main elements uh, in the plastic and are they not the elements but the the compounds so calcium is only is 40 percent of calcium carbonate so whether the compound is below 50 percent of plastic so if it's embedded in below 50 percent it doesn't count as a nanomaterial embedded form you'd still want to have with your leachables prove that nothing's leaching out whether it's these materials but you don't have a leaching problem but as long as it's bound it's below 50 percent you can also argue from a surgical point of view it's below 50 percent of plastic and therefore not a nanomaterial so even the short-term contact is not a problem um, we normally combine the testing with an engineering review of the materials because there's always semantics about what's in contact and, and particle size when you do get a result. Um, but we, anytime we're testing for CMRs or endocrine disruptors, it's testing an engineering review also anyways. So very, very maps into it very easily. Uh, not terribly expensive if you're doing endocrine disruption and CMRs already, which are hundreds of substances, it's it's straightforward. Um, this is one of the most common modern approaches. I can't say it's the approach from a year ago, but it's becoming more and more common because it gives you objective evidence, a test report, which includes many things. One of the things that addresses nanomaterials, the risk is low. You'd also want to make sure you address biocides. Are you using any biocides? Because the different whole kettle of fish should be using a biocide, and that needs to be addressed. This is one of the most common approaches. The big advantage is content testing. It's really easy to add with CMR and endocrine disrupting. And the majority of medical device companies are now using it for uh, the, the CMR endocrine disruption, the 10.4 compliance. The, the, the supply chain is better for medical and invasive devices, but not great. Um, this is just a much safer way to handle. And in, what we're also seeing for a lot of medical devices is the monomer version of the chemical has over 0.1 something, NMP, um, a TGIC, a variety of other chemicals. However, the finished version does not. So what the supplier tells you and what the finished version are, are quite different. And it's a very significant difference. Not only do we sometimes not get exactly the materials you think you have, which is not even medical device is not super uncommon, but what the manufacturer has in the safety data sheet isn't exactly what the final version of plastic is. But and the coatings. The coatings in particular are usually quite different. Um, so testing is the most common approach to compliance. It also gives one of the best objective evidences, evidence, documents, having a test report with this data and pictures. And it's straightforward to add potential nanomaterial elements to the testing and verification. There's an end review, say they, they tested, they reviewed it. If there's a super high risk, you can always test individual particles for SEM. That doesn't work fantastically well because it's particle distribution. And that really has to be done usually by the original powder manufacturer because testing one or two particles doesn't really cut it. Um, nanomaterials do not have a great guidance on that kind of specifics. If I want to test an individual particle, I can use a SEM or a CHEM, depending what size we're looking at. However, it's one particle and it doesn't, it's not necessarily indicative of uh, the distribution. So it's a bit tricky. So what we look at here is instead of saying, hey, is it embedded? Is it below 50%? Um, and that's the main, do we use any biocides? No, and saying something very tangible about that risk. So 
recap, compliance approaches, statement, and, and I wouldn't necessarily say just one. <laughs> the statement works with all of them. Statement on the risk of nanomaterials. Uh, review leachable testing for potential nanomaterials if your leachable testing set up that way. And testing for elements that could be nanomaterials to confirm embedded, embedded potential nanomaterials are below 50% of the plastic. So in the stationary form, unreleased, it wouldn't count as nanomaterials because they're embedded and below 50% of the mass. Yes, it's really 50% of the particle count, but when in doubt, 50% of the mass is a pretty good reasonable approximation. Um, how can I help? Well, we can help you with the statement for sure. We you know, reference it and here's the expert opinion. This is why it's low risk in the embedded version and no intentional biocides and have at least a third-party document. Um, we also do testing related to nanomaterials. And when in doubt, you say, we only have so many plastics. Okay, we can test those and provide the test data. We More and more, we're testing the whole device because it's often quite interesting how different the device is in the final form. But more often than not, it's one device that represents a range of products because the materials are very similar. So happy to help. Um, we do a tremendous amount of this. We test geez, uh, tens of thousands of medical devices a year, maybe a little bit less than that, but about that actually. Um, be happy to help. So again, laboratory testing, when in doubt for CMR, endocrine disruptors, ROHS, REACH, nanomaterials. All you have to do for quoting is send us the picture or a web link, just we need to know what it is and we can give you a quote. Monthly quarterly updates, just reach out to us. These are really good. We have about 70 plus companies that do this. Um, we sit down and we explain the changes and like skip right now is changing every month and how the guidance is evolving, how it actually affects your products. And if you make a, you know, I make one person makes a tractor trailer, one other person makes a guitar, one makes new LED light, one makes a handheld surgical implement, how it actually affects you. Um, like the subtleties, like, oh yeah, batteries, packs including the cable and all the electronics in the battery pack are not in scope of ROHS because battery packs cover the battery directive. However, the phthalate restrictions of the reach apply to battery packs unless the battery pack is medical, then it's out of scope again. And provide the references and explain why all that is just to make your life more complicated. Um, and it's very interactive. You ask questions and say, hey, wait a minute, we make something that has this. How does this apply? Well, that's a really good question. Or my customer's asking for this. What are they talking about? My supplier told me they had all these things in their product. I said, no, they didn't. Oops, there's, there's a mistake. Um, and explain what the mistake usually is. A lot of the uh, standard testing, grind testing for SVHCs, do not work right. There's some errors in it. Um, in particular, the way they dissolve borosilicate glass using accidental chlorine ions creates a whole bunch of false diboron trioxide and, bor and boric acid uh, measurement results. Lots of reasons. And we explain. Um, but let's skip. Um, we probably the biggest player in the skip side, actually, uh, where we sit down, explain the rules, take one of your product, walk you through doing a declaration in Excel, then doing a declaration in Euclid, giving you the processes and all the templates, and then not leaving you out, you know, out in an iceberg. And we can do as little or as much as you need. When in doubt, we can do your product line. Um, what actually is often very common is saying, this is all the stuff we sell in the EU. How do we handle this? Well, you can have the projects and have two grouping. Skip main projects have two groups. Your main products that you will make skip platform declarations that handle wide ranges of products under the same platform. And then you're going to have a lot of jetsam and flotsam, stuff you sell with it. We, you know, we provide manuals and this, that, and the other thing that are separate items or we kit stuff together. How do we handle that? So there's a separate miscellaneous category project where we check off. What you really need for SKIP, not only what's in the system, your distributor needs the SKIP number as of next year for everything they, they sell of yours. So what you're really also going to need is everything you sell into Europe, you're going to need a solution path. It's either a SKIP number or a no SPHC or a handful of cases not applicable. Uh, food, that kind of thing. Um, pharma, chemicals, not applicable. You sell reagents, reagents not applicable. And how, how to handle all that. So what you're going through Everybody's going through. So many people are focused on, let's figure out the structure of how we declare the lap lap. Well, you have to declare the part, the product, the component that has the SVHC and the SVHC in it. And then what you normally do is you group all the same product family together as one declaration, as long as you list, if it's a consumer product, all the UPC codes, it's a professional product, all the model ranges. Awesome, very straightforward. Meanwhile, you will have like, well, we also provide some plastic bags, a dongle. The miscellaneous category is the problem job. So how do you handle both? because you need to solve both. And so we'll walk you through all that. Um, I've talked on for a bit here. Uh, oh, I'm almost right on time. If you have any questions, put it in the control panel. This is a bit hand wavy. Um, some really good questions here. 
Yeah, the acronyms are fun. So are the presentation slides available? Two things, everybody who registered receive a copy of the presentation. Um, and there'll be a recording of this available uh, probably the next couple of days. Um, and people will be able to, to, to download it. There also should be a YouTube version where you can slow me down, which a lot of people are very popular. They move me down to 70% speed. I sound like a human again. My mom can understand me mostly. Uh, yeah, my mother is not terribly impressed with how fast I speak. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> sometimes a lot of details. What does SKIP stand for again? Awesome. Substance of concern as or such in complex products. That's why they use a small word like skip. So skip, if you ever reach SPHC, a substance of very high concern, and any component about 0.1% by weight, the product, the component, and the SPHC have to go in the skip database by Jan 5th, 2021. You can tell I've said that a couple of times. Um, it's very, very important. It's a public declaration. If you don't do it, you can't sell. It's a declarable, not a restriction. There is the ability to do reasonable worst case scenario declarations, and we explain all of that and how you do it in practice and what the punishment levels are. If you don't do it, you can't sell and your distributor can't sell. However, if you declare honestly and there's an error, it's a much lower, lesser thing and it's more of a correction in the future. So explain exactly how to do all of that in practical methods, where at worst case situation, you're looking at an update in the future. What analytical methods do you use to test for CMR and endocrine disruption products? Awesome question. It's very, very, very complex. There is Let's say there is no one solution path. What we end up having to do, and we've been audited by must be eight or 10 different medical companies on this, plus of course our own ISO auditors, is every single CMR and endocrine disruptor, we have to develop a solution path for it. And the path is multi-stage. So we're not going this in blind and saying, hey, we have 400 and some chemicals. Let's test for every single one individually. What we actually do is we have screening processes where first you can screen things out. They can't be present because these, element, these chemicals can't be present because they all have sulfur in them and there's no sulfur in this part. All of these need sulfur and zinc and so on and so forth. So there's a screening process combined with XRF, which does elements, and FTIR, which does organics. And to screen down and every chemical is a different solution path, that then combined with an engineering evaluation, especially around colorants and such, there are then, for each material, there may be additional tests depending on the screening. So the screening says, yes, we have ortho phthalates. The screening can't tell us which ortho phthalate, but it tells us we have an ortho phthalate or likely have an ortho phthalate. Then we have to do a GCMS test that's specific to orthophthalates. So every single one has a path that we have all the tin stabilizers. There is a tin presence and they have a solution path. There's the azo colorants where the azo colorants are interesting because they are a myriad of chemicals. But the main test process eventually is you basically smash the azo colorants apart and all the different range of azo colorants are only made up of about 12 different building blocks. And so you test whether or not the 12 building blocks are present for azos. So there is a different solution path for every single one. What we have to do is in our medical device regulation process justification, um, we first have to list every single applicable CMR and endocrine disruptor and the solution path for each. And our process then is a multi-stage that walks them through the solution path, where many have common solution paths early on and then diverge based on the original results. So there's not one simple analytical method. There's definitely a screening of XRF and FTIR and actually a tiny bit of wick chemistry. Um, some of them are oxides, and we use a different uh, process for oxides. Um, and then FTR, which is organics, and that is a combination of, of substance and materials identification. Some of the solution paths are based on the material substrate. And then there is GCMS or LCMS, and there's a few other situations, like asbestos is, is TEM and such. Um, Follow-up method. So a lot of variety. And then the, the GCMS method, even same equipment, is different for phthalates than it is for a lot of the flame retardants, which is different from... Uh, the dibutyl tins, so each has their own specific uh, solution path. So um, if you wish more detail, we can definitely walk you through it. It's 
It's because there's such a range of substance, you really go through a screening process, evaluation process, and then there's a, a more specific follow-up. So instead of testing for 400 unique methods for single material, which is cost prohibitive, you end up screening it down that this individual material only needs one or some zero additional tests because what it is. So we can walk you through it. We always do retest VHCs at the same time because the overlap is so strong. The one big difference is, is retest VHCs of bioaccumulants, um, which are not normally CMRs, and that provides a difference. So like silicone is very unlikely to be a problem for EUMDR, but it's quite likely to be a problem for retest VHC, and that's because of the D6 siloxane monomer. Um, and so for reach SVHC, which is 209 some substances, we also have to have the same solution pass matrix that, believe it or not, runs on top of the same process. Um, and we can explain all the processes. It's complex. I think where I think the word is, is it complicated where it's a lot of little things because there's so many substances, but each one has a solution path, many of which share stages in common. Um, but a good question. Um, what happens if I coat something in thin coating of silver? Is that nanocrystal? That's a good question. Uh, my first instinct would say no. However, um, what we normally do is, is either reference someone else's work or we can measure particle size, sizes. But unless you're the first person to ever do it, there's usually a description. And how are coatings treated for nanomaterials is a really good question. When you spire it on, it ends up kind of being crystal formation. It's a really good question. Um, something we'd have to look at. One of the other questions is when will the nanomaterials be part of ROHS? It'll be on a material by materials um, a basis. Um, normally a material has to be classified in some way, usually through CLP or biocide, that it has some hazard. And then um, it would have to be nominated to go through the ROHS consultation process because of its hazard. And then after a variety of consultations, the EU Commission determines that it is a risk to recycling workers, the environment, or recycling facility. It'll end up being added and restricted some couple of years in the future. So nanomaterials specific restriction to ROHS is probably four or five years away, and it would be in a nanomaterial at the time. <laughs> Which one they picked first? In some ways, it really depends where they think the risk really is. How can we get a quote for testing? Uh, yeah, good question. Just contact us. We just know what the product is. Just a picture or a web link. As long as we know what it is, straightforward. Or like, look, we're looking at the ROHS 3 of the phthalate deadline. It's really soon. Uh, we can't solve anything, everything. Can you help us with the parts we can't solve? Absolutely. Um, now, in the invasive side, generally the supply chain is decent. Not perfect, but decent. In the non-invasive side, the phthalates declarations are not that trustworthy. Um, there's more any reason for that, human error being part of it. But definitely when people say, hey, this whole product has no phthalates in it, there's tons of wires and gaskets and heat shrink. And it's, if you don't test it normally, it's normally not compliant. If the individual particle is nano size, but exists as an agglomerate that's larger than one micron, would it still be considered nanomaterial? Yes, it's the size of the particles that make up the agglomerate. That's a really good question. So if it's like sandstone and the sand is below, uh, 100 nanometers, the standstone is a nanomaterial. It's one of the reasons why we look at embedded plastic saying, you know what, if it's embedded and it's below 50%, it as a stationary item is not a nanomaterial. A coating could be, but as a, a stationary embedded item, below 50%, it's not a nanomaterial. Now, what comes out could be a nanomaterial. And you want to make sure there's no release of whichever chemical, titanium, or so on and so forth downstream. Um, but in the embedded form, below 50%, it's not a nanomaterial. Uh, but as an agglomerate, it is the size of the individual particles. It's a really good question. So like the sandstone, is, it would be judged as nanomaterial based on the, the average size of the sand itself in the sandstone. Well, thanks much for everybody joining. Um, pleasure hosting everyone. And we'll probably have another one um, quite possibly actually on, on practical elements of SKIP, not the database side, but more like I have these lists of products that I'm selling in Europe. How does this project actually, what does it look like? What does the project really look like? So many people are still so much in the weeds. Like I'm trying to declare my product. That's awesome. But really what you, the output is, you can have a list of things you sell in Europe. You're going to have to have a skip number or an OSVHC thing against each one in a separate column. How do you get there? And, and walk through all the different processes for that. So thanks much to everyone. Uh, pleasure hosting everyone. And I look to talk to everyone again soon.